This morning we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 32. And the last time the sermon was titled, Jesus is with us in the storms, and three people came forward to receive Jesus last Sunday. Um, just a really good message, no matter what you're going through. Uh, Isaiah, we're actually in Isaiah on Sunday mornings. It has 66 chapters. So every 10 chapters, roughly, we take a break and we just move to some topical message in the New Testament. It's just really been a great rhythm. So uh, good message uh, this Sunday. The message is contrasting cultures, and it's kind of interesting because 2,700 years ago, what God was doing in his people, uh, we could make parallels today. You have three basic cultures. You had the cultures of the world. Uh, I'm, I love history. If you studied history, you know, th this was just a, an era of a few centuries of where everybody was conquering everybody, you know, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. Uh, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and it just was a chaotic time in history, but God was still there for his people and for those that wanted to turn to, to him. So you had the culture of the world, which was all about self-aggrandizement, power, wealth, riches, and that's one culture, and we can see that today. It's very easy in America to see these, these cultures of the world and what they try to vie for without God. The second and third cultures are very interesting because the second culture that we're going we're gonna to look at is the culture of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was surrounded in 701 BC by the Assyrian army on all sides. They were trying to starve them out. They were trying to besiege them to get in and conquer them. And Jerusalem, you would have thought, out of all of Israel, north and south of Israel, that that would be the place where the biggest contingent of God's people were. Right? Remember the, the wilderness wanderings, the miracles, the, the taking of Jerusalem. Unfortunately, though, there were a lot of people that were very religious and gave God lip service, but their hearts weren't for him. And that's interesting today because we can look at Christendom. We can look at um, the church as an organization. And in every church, there are some that are there because they really love the Lord, have a true relationship with him, want to learn more through his word, and then people who were there for other reasons. So within Christendom, even Jesus said, you had the wheat, the good, and the tares, which were the bad. That brings me to the last culture. The last culture is the godly remnant. This is the remnant that, back in the day, that although Jerusalem was going apostate, they were turning their back on God, they were making ungodly decisions. There was a small group of people who were praying. They were praying for their nation. They were praying for their neighbors. They were praying for the unbelievers to come to salvation. They were interceding. Um, and you know, you can make the parallel today, right? In, in churches or in church as an organization, they're going to be the, that number. It's not for me to decide. God knows and the people know. You know if you have a relationship with the Lord or you don't. But there's always going to be that godly remnant, that small percentage or group that are totally devoted to the Lord, totally sacrificial. It's kind of funny I'm talking about Mother's Day, sacrificial, right? Sacrifice. And true believers understand sacrifice. They're others-centered. They're concerned, not only for their own well-being, but for the well-beings of others. So we're going to look at this in five parts and look at uh, the difference between what's the world's utopia or the world's ideal versus God's ideal through the historical event. We're going to jump in. Starting in verse 1, it says, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule with justice, a man will be as a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And you might look at this and go, wow, that seems to be way out of context. There's an invasion. You know, God, God is speaking through Isaiah. Isaiah, give us something that we can hold on to. But actually, it is in context. Number one is behold the coming king. Now, I like to do my messages and then just look around. I, there's some respected commentators that I read. Um, some believe, well, this could be Hezekiah. This could be Josiah. No, it's too perfect. This is a, a picture from 701 B.C. all the way past 2018 to Messiah's kingdom, to what we know as the millennial kingdom. Right? The lion will lay down with the lamb and all these wonderful things will be happening that we also look forward to this utopia, right? This is exciting because we look at this world and this world's terrifying. You know, the media is talking about all kinds of weird stuff, but 
there's some serious things going on in the Middle East that can plunge us into one of the last great battles. Uh, and a lot of people are out to lunch. They're not paying attention. They don't see the parallels to Ezekiel 38 and 39 and the, all the nations that are aligned in this last great battle. But after that, in God's timing, he will set up his utopia. And that's something that we look forward to. We see some metaphors that in this utopia, and this is a reality, man tries to make utopia on the earth. But God, has he had it in the garden before sin entered the world, and he will have it again in the future. Very exciting. So we look at the metaphors, shelter, security, provision, and refreshment. Very nice. Verse 3, it said, The eyes of those who see will not be dim. It's funny, I just had a new prescription on my glasses, and my eyesight's getting worse. And I, four years ago, um, I've been having the same prescription, and I'm, I'm wondering why I can't read anymore, because my eyes are changing. So when they gave me the glasses for the first time, and I looked at them, I'm like, whoa, this is, I can see, it's a miracle, it's great. But we continue to read, uh, and the ears of those who hear will listen, and the heart of the rash will understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers will be ready to speak plainly. So in Messiah's kingdom, the real cool thing is everyone's going to be blessed. Now, this is, I, I said this in a former message, and I'm going to say it again. Jesus came in the first century, and he couldn't pass a blind person without healing them. He couldn't pass a lame person without healing them and helping them to walk again. I mean, this was, this was his ministry. But more importantly than that, because the human body dies, right? We, this is the situation that we're kind of stuck in due to sin. What more importantly that he did was Jesus sometimes used that to bring people and bridge them to the understanding of spiritual things. So he would often speak about those that were blind spiritually. They were blind physically. That was an easy one to heal. Sometimes the other one's a little bit more difficult because it, there's an act of free will involved. So Jesus helped people who had a misunderstanding, who were spiritually rash, he got them to really understand God and to come back as prodigal children. And in the millennial kingdom, we're going to see this as well. No one's going to be deceived. No one's going to be uh, fooled by cults anymore or deceived by the media. They're just going to know it. And that's an exciting thing to look forward to as well. We continue on. Verse 5. It says, the foolish person will no longer be called generous or noble. Hmm. The foolish person will no... So does that happen today? Foolish people are called noble? Watch TV, right? Nor the miser said to be bountiful. You ever see some of these politicians screaming about they, they, the poor and they're going to help the poor and then you find out that they're wealthy beyond belief and they give very little of their wealth. And yeah, you see a lot of head shaking. Uh, Arthur Brooks wrote a book, Who Really Cares? And he actually chronicled all the loudmouths, all the politicians who talked about how much they want. And you know what he found? That the usually, the, well, actually what he found, and he wasn't from this political persuasion, he found that the people who give the highest percentage of what they have are Bible-believing Christians. And he didn't really like where he was going with this, but he published it and he was honest anyway. So who really cares? The miser is said to be bountiful. Oh, I fight for the poor. Do you really? Does your wallet show that? Your checkbook. For the foolish person will speak foolishness, okay? This is going to be reality. And his heart will work sin or iniquity to practice ungodliness, to utter error against the Lord to keep the hungry unsatisfied. He's not going to do anything to help the hungry, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. Also, the schemes of the schemer are evil. He devises wicked plans to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speak justice. But a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. So what we're going to see is, is true colors. It's a great... It's a great phrase. You know, a person who tries to pretend they're going to be exposed for what they are. If they're really evil and they're liars, they're going to be exposed. If they're really good, that's also going to be um, something that's obvious in the millennial kingdom. So two out of five is the contrasting the coming king with some of the wicked aristocratic leaders who were sort of celebrities of Isaiah's day. Wow. 
So it happened back then, and it happens, unfortunately, in every society. And in the age of, of media and spin and doctoring video clips and all that, I really believe, you know, the Bible says that we're in the age of information, but there's another part of that. We're also in the age of disinformation. And as Christians, this is why we need to be Bible literate. Somebody said, and I don't know who, and you can tell me afterwards if it's a famous person, but uh, years ago, I remember somebody calling the television the idiot box because that's what happens to us if we watch it enough. It's a deceptive form of propaganda, unfortunately, by a, a small group of people who have the control over the airwaves. And the majority of them are not believers in God. They're not interested in His way. But there's this, there was this idyllic facade, this I, I, idyllic facade, and we see that today. You know, how much are you reading about the royal wedding? You know, how much is that being pumped up? You know, listen, what's going on in Syria can plunge us into World War III, and the media is focusing on things that, quite frankly, I don't think they matter. Now, I don't have a, a favorable or unfavorable position about the, the royal wedding cr coming up. I don't really know enough about it. But are they better than you? You know, is it better than what you do? It, it, or, or should we look at them as this, the, these people that are lifted up to this great height. And this is what we have in our culture. It could be the entertainment industry, it could be the, the media complex, and what they do is they find a person, uh, maybe they write music for them, maybe they tell them what to say, this young and up-and-coming person, and they put them up as this, as this symbol that we're supposed to look at, and you find out later they're just like we are. Lies, so many lies. It's not going to be that way in Messiah's kingdom the millennial kingdom. There's another attorney general, <laughs> another I say, because there was more than one that had to resign uh, in New York, who he was part of the Me Too movement. Oh, I'm for women's rights. Oh, you, you know who this guy is. And then you find out later that he uh, was abusing women, physically, sexually, threatening them. I'll tap your phones if you go to anybody. Hey, I'm the attorney general. Who do you believe anymore? Talk show hosts, right? Well, that, that person... They, they minister to me. They make me feel good. Well, but where's the discernment? This is why it is so important for Christians to be Bible literate. When religious leaders speak, do we just take what they say? Do you just take what I say? Or do you read your Bibles? Bible literacy is extremely important because we live in an age of deception. Some of these famous people, by their very words, speak things that are against the Lord and His way that want nothing to do with him. But verse 8, those with good character will be known for what they do as well. They'll be known for what they do. Right? Who does the media put up as their media darlings? Right? Who do they like? Who do they support? And again, uh, only because he stood the test of time, you know, Tim Tebow, the ball player, um, he wants to be celibate till, till marriage. He wants... You know, he believes in Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and all they do is mock the guy. They're constantly mocking him. Even Denzel Washington, who was a, uh, he's an icon in Hollywood, he's really starting to move towards, to, to uh, you know, I believe he was always a Christian, but he's really starting to get serious about his Christian faith. You don't really see that in the mainstream media because they don't want to cover that. But you'll find that in other sources. See what I'm saying? The media is an agenda-driven agency. Back in the day, they didn't have the technology that we did, but, but the same thing is happening. And Isaiah is saying, don't believe the hype, so to speak. You know, look up to God. Understand what his word says. What does God want? Verse 9, we continue. Now he says, this is a different group he's speaking to. Rise up, you women who are, who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In a year and some days, you will be troubled you complacent women, for the vintage will fail. The gathering will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent ones. Strip yourselves, make yourselves bare, and gird sackcloth on your waist. People mourn upon their breasts. They shall mourn upon their breasts for the pleasant fields for the fruitful vine. On the land of my people will come up thorns and briars. Yes, on all the happy homes in the joyous city, because the palaces will be forsaken, the bustling city will be deserted, the forts and towers will become lairs forever, a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. 
So three is the burden or the oracle to the haughty women of Jerusalem. Now, the Bible's not politically correct, as you can see. I do have to explain, explain some of the colloquialisms back in the day. What does that mean? You know, you can look at something quickly and make a wrong judgment, or you can actually read the Word, study the Word, meditate on the Word, and come to a right conclusion. You had the men who were the leaders that he speaks about, the celebrities, the aristocrats, um, the, the people were almost worshiping them and worshiping their decisions, although their decisions that were being made were against God, trying to get Egypt on their side instead of trusting the Lord, trying to get Babylon on their side instead of trusting the Lord. The Lord's like, I'm going to take care of this, this, this invasion of these Assyrians, but you've got to stop trying to do all these things in your own strength. So he speaks about the men. Now he speaks about to this group of women. He addresses them, and they are the wives and the daughters of the aristocracy. And he's basically, these ladies, they only cared about themselves. They didn't care about suffering of anyone else. They had almost like a let them eat cake sort of attitude, right? However, they were going to get a wake-up call when Assyria was marching south, licking up town after town in Judah, and then eventually standing outside the gates of Jerusalem. So let me just put that in perspective today because it's, it's a hard thing to comprehend. Um, because the United States, we've pretty much always been sovereign since we broke away from the British. But let's just say for argument's sake that Canada had an equally strong military as we do. And let's say that they were hostile, a hostile neighbor. And let's say that Canada started invading. They come into New York, they come into New Jersey, I mean, I studied a lot of economics in college. By the way, war economics, phew, the dollar wouldn't be worth anything, especially if they were making gains on land coming towards where we live. You see what I'm saying? So what Isaiah was saying is, you got to get out of this complacent attitude. You got to get out of this self-indulgent attitude because when the Assyrians start coming south, you better turn to God because otherwise it's going to be too late. So to me, I always say this, discipline equals love. And he was telling them, you, your mindset is way wrong. Your selfishness is going to destroy you. So it's interesting. Again, I'll, I'll repeat it for the recording, because I did say it during my opening regarding Mother's Day. Chuck Smith said that the character of women in any society is a reflection of the moral compass of society. Interesting. It's a compliment to women. He didn't say it about men. So basically, if the women in any particular society are still holding down the fort, they're still godly women, um, society's in a good place. But when the men start to go, and then the women start to go as well, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Good point. Verses 11 through 12, where sackcloth and mourn and beating, beating of the breast was a sign of mourning. That's what it meant. So, so strip down of your, um, your elite clothing and put on sackcloth. The kings did that, uh, uh, prophets did that, godly people did that. And it was a sign of mourning. It was a sign of sadness. It was a sign that either the individual wasn't doing the right thing and was repenting, or the nation, or both. Right? Nehemiah interceded for himself and his nation. Uh, Josiah did the same thing. He found the book of the law, and he said, boy, we're really not following this, and he tore his garments. Um, Hezekiah did this. You, you see this all throughout the scripture. Um, basically that everyone was going to suffer loss as the Assyrians were moving south towards Jerusalem. It was a wake-up call. Now verses 13 and 14, again explaining these colloquialisms, um, you find that the elitists end up abandoning. You know, as, as the threat is coming closer, this, this wake-up call, they start to abandon fields, According to the scripture, their palaces too close to the border that where the Assyrians are. I got to get out of here because the Assyrians were no, known for their brutality when they would capture someone. Forts and towers only to be inhabited by what? Weeds, thorns, and wild animals. Right? You ever watch? You ever see pictures of abandoned um, places in the world? Every once in a while, you'll see it kind of on the news and you just click onto it. It'll show you places in the United States, Russia, like just factories or palaces or even in Europe. You know, the, the French aristocracy and just these, they're like ghost towns, beautiful structures, architectural feats. And you know who lives in there? Animals live in there. So nothing's really much changed. 
I love that about God's Word. I mean, you can just, you can make any comparison to see that everything he says always comes to pass. And listen, we get frustrated today because there are those that, I was watching, um, my wife and I were watching uh, uh, an expose on Washington, D.C. It's terrible. It's a terrible place. They say that Washington, D.C. is it's definitely the PCP capital of the United States. And they, they just showed how the dealers, I mean, so many people, it's sad. Um, and then they, get, they go on a bad trip and they start like hacking people up with knives or whatever. D.C. is a place where the, the, the people that control this country operate. And right outside uh, their, their beautiful, ornate, you know, halls of government are, is, is suffering. You know what I'm saying? And you wonder, again, all this about the elites. They can't even take care of the elites in the next block from their, their government palaces, let alone telling us what we should do. So God's not fooled. We may be fooled by what we see on TV. We may be fooled by certain speeches. But in the end, the truth will come out. And that's what I like to hang my hat on. That's true justice, when the truth comes out. I like that. Verse 15, he continues. He who walks... Oh, excuse me, wrong, wrong part. <laughs> Until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, God's Holy Spirit, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted as a forest, then, okay... We're, we're, seeing, we're going to the future again. We're going back and forth from 701 B.C. to a future time from 2018, right? which we all look forward to. And the fruitful field is counted as a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Strong, strong language. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Though hail comes down on the forest, and the city is brought low in humiliation, blessed are you, now speaking to the individual, speaking to you, blessed are you who sow beside all waters, who send out freely the feet of the ox and the donkey. And this has a, a physical and a spiritual connotation. So for peace and restoration comes after repentance okay justice or justice righteousness peace quietness and assurance these are staples in the millennial kingdom staples in the millennial kingdom never again will we wonder well this person did this crime and that person did that crime you know why is it different in different states why is it different depending on the lawyers they had you know there will be equal justice truly under the law and as good as our system is compared to our other countries, our system still falls short. Okay, but Christ will be reigning in Jerusalem and everything will be made right. That's exciting to look at. Um, and true right righteousness comes from trusting in Christ's sinlessness and sacrifice for our sins. So if you're here for the first time and you've maybe never heard or somebody dragged you in here because it's Mother's Day, I get it, those things happen. They bribed you with lunch afterwards, I don't know. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't share, and, and again, speaking about Mother's Day, and, and again, looking back at my life, I mean, we were, back then, we were poor. I mean, we lived in a basement, and, you know, there was an oven that kept us warm, and I always wondered why my mom was so skinny, and then I found out later, there wasn't a lot of food, and she would always feed my sister and I first. My mother is a picture, I just talked to her on the phone, she moved further away, uh, I just talked to her on the phone on the way to church, just wishing her a happy Mother's Day, sending her flowers, because I don't forget that sacrifice. Now, Jesus Christ came to sacrifice in a way that's so powerful that he came to this world fully man and fully God. And his whole purpose, if you listen, watch his teachings, read his teachings, his whole purpose was he had the cross in his, in his cross here. That was his focus because he knew that the only way for us to have eternal life was for our sins to be paid for. And the soul that sins shall die, the Bible says. So what do we do as human beings? Because we're all sinners. We can't die for each other's sins. We don't have that capacity. Fully God, fully man. He bore the sins of the cross of humankind 
bore the sins of, of the world, of humankind, on the cross, that if we believe in him and believe in that sacrifice, we can have eternal life. That is a, a, an incredible sacrifice that transcends any that we could experience on this planet. Pretty powerful. Verse 15, we're speaking about God's Spirit, God's Holy Spirit. And I love the harmony in the Scripture. One of my Jewish friends, he actually called me yesterday. We, we were talking about some things, and he goes, oh, I was watching your videos online. <laughs> now, he's not a believer, I say, yet. And he goes, oh, that was great. You're in the book of Isaiah, and like we're having this awesome discussion. He goes, then when you started talking about Jesus, he goes, I turned it off. We're, he's very frank with me, you know what I'm saying? So then I started, like, I was like caught off guard. I'm like, wow, this is a cool conversation. Started talking about the Lord, and, and, and it was cool because he's like, you know, you, you know more about my faith than I do. And I would, I would be quoting books in the Old Testament. I said, bro, you got to read these books. This is so important. But the Holy Spirit, sometimes people are like, well, what's this thing about you Christians? The Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, it's all throughout the Old Testament. And it's very clear in the Old Testament. That's the beauty. And I told them on the phone, I said, there's the harmony between the Old Testament and the New Testament. You have this worldly, watching too much TV, history channel, that stuff, mentality about how Christians, that if you're Jewish, you, you relinquish your Judaism to become a Christian. I said, bro, you got it all wrong. So we had a really pleasant conversation. I didn't expect it, but I was, I'm ready, in season and out of season. Um, and he's a dear friend. I've known him for decades, but it's kind of cool because some of the things that I'm reading in the Old Testament, a lot of people worldly think that that's a Christian thing. I remember one time he said to me, what's with this sin stuff? I said, you people started with the sin thing, you know what I'm saying? I said, that's your neck of the woods. Here, let me tell you. And he, he like starts these conversations with me. And then when I start educating him, he goes, oh, I don't want to talk about it anymore. So pray for him. I won't say his name. and He might even be listening in, in the future or tonight. It's a weird thing when you video stuff, but um, okay, I'll, I'll be done with that. Uh, verse 20 is an agrarian maxim, and it basically says, Blessed are you who sow beside all waters, who send out freely the feet of the ox and the donkey. Or what do you do with what's most valuable to you? What do you do? You know, do we, yes, was there a physical uh, application, but you got to look at the spiritual applications here. Because, you know, in this area, I mean, we're close to Princeton. We have overeducated people. We have people with degrees everywhere. In this part of the world, in this time, most people didn't have an education. So God used metaphors. He used parables. And it was really cool because he could reach the educated, and he also could reach the uneducated. Even if they couldn't read, you know, you're, you, you can, even if you're, you can't read and you don't go to school, as you grow and you interact with your parents, you understand the language. So he was using this language and using metaphors that they could, oh, they could all relate to. But the truth is, what do we do with what we have? You know, what do we do with what's valuable to us? Do we, you know, our, our heart, our wealth, our dreams, our desires, are we sowing these seeds near living waters or are we just keeping them for ourselves? You know, what are we doing with the ox and the animals that they would send out? And people today are like, I, I can't understand that. Basically, what he was saying is your livestock was your wealth. That was your life, your livestock. So, you know, what are we sending out? You know, where are we putting our wealth? Where are we putting our time? These are questions that only we can answer. Just a few more verses in the next chapter, and then we'll finish it next Sunday. Uh, chapter 33, verse 1, because it goes with it. Woe to you who plunder, though you have not been plundered, and you who deal treacherously, though they have not dealt treacherously with you. When you cease plundering, you will be plundered. This is kind of like the biblical version of what goes around comes around, right? And when you make an end of dealing treacherously, they will deal treacherously with you. Now, this is different people speaking too. O oh Lord, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. Be their arm for every morning. Our salvation also in the time of trouble. At the noise of the tumult, the people shall flee. When you lift yourself up, the nation shall be scattered. And your plunder shall be gathered, like the gathering of the caterpillar. As the running to and fro of locusts, he shall run upon them. 
The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion, or the Mount of Jerusalem there, with justice and righteousness. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times. And the strength of salvation, the fear of the Lord, is his treasure. Surely the valiant ones shall cry outside. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. The highways lie waste. The wayfaring man ceases. He has broken the covenant. He has despised the cities. He regards no man. The earth mourns and languishes. Lebanon is shamed and shriveled. Sharon is like a wilderness, and Bashan and Carmel shake off their fruits. So five out of five is woe to the plundering Assyrians. This is amazing because this is in the form of a dialogue. God speaks through Isaiah, and then the godly remnants speak, and they're interceding. They want to see justice. They want to see righteousness. Not everybody was praying, but the godly remnant was praying, right? They understood a relationship with God. And God's word through all these prophets would go to the foreign lands. Some historical notes when the Rabshakeh of Assyria was taunting Hezekiah and Jerusalem, we're going to get you, we're going to destroy you. Um, He started speaking in Hebrew because he wanted to unnerve the guards on top of the wall. Um, God would, would say, well, this is what I think the king, should, this is what I want the king to do and the people. He would also say, and by the way, send this scroll to the Rabshakeh, the Assyrian, the invaders. And in the letter, they, the guy probably gave it to him and ran because God was like, you're, you're going to get it. <laughs> you know, you're going to be disciplined. You're going to be dealt treacherously with. And what happened was Assyria had relative ease and peace uh, and they just were, had such a bloodlust for power and war that they grew and they grew and they just tormented people. They would just invade and make their lives miserable and expatriate them. No Geneva connect, Convention back then. And God said, listen, you, you better cut it out because if I have to deal with you, it's not going to be pretty. And he did. And it wasn't pretty. Uh, the treacherousness part was, a lot of this is historical, is King Ahaz uh, sent money to the Assyrians and said, hey, we want to be friends, you know, please don't come after us. And then King Hezekiah was a godly man, but in a moment of weakness, he also sent money to the Assyrians and said, please don't invade us. I'm paraphrasing. The Assyrians were so treacherous that they took the money and said, okay. And then a little later on, they mustered their troops and invaded anyway. So they took the money, they broke the agreement, and then they invaded the land and took more. Uh, So that's the whole treachery thing. Uh, And the Assyrians, it it came back on them. Uh, In one night, the angel of the Lord smote 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And that ended the conquest of Jerusalem. All soldiers are gone. Um, So you see this conversation between God and, and the godly remnant, asking the Lord to intercede for them, to judge Assyria, to get them off their backs. Um... So James 2.13 tells us, no mercy, this is the New Testament, by the way, no mercy will be shown, and I add in parentheses, by God, to those who don't show mercy to others. Galatians Galatians 6.7 says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a a person sows, that he or she will reap. You know? And... You, you, listen, you might be going through something right now. You might be going through a coworker trying to destroy your reputation. You might be dealing with somebody who, in, in the neighborhood, and I've seen this, that they just, they're just hell-bent on making other people's lives miserable. You know, let's make this personal. You might be going through something that um, you, you're scared, you're frightened. You know? But this, this type of person, eventually, if they don't repent, God will judge them. And, and I like justice. You know, I was a cop for 25 years. Um, I like to see when the true bad guy, the true bad guy was put away to stop him from victimizing others. So, you know, I, I think justice is something in our hearts that we long for. When we see especially a child abuser get off on a technicality, it bothers all of us. It interferes with our sense of justice. That's not right. You know, he might have even admitted it. There'd be all kinds of evidence and the person walks free. That's not justice. You know what I'm saying? So God is a God of justice. And although we may see someone seemingly getting away with it or even becoming wealthy and ripping people off, if the authorities don't get them here, God will deal with them in the afterlife. You can take that to the bank. Uh, Verse 6. 
he says, he says, well, they say the Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times. People are in a panic. There's, there's foreign soldiers outside the gates. They want to hurt us. They want to steal from us. They're trampling our vineyards and our gardens and our harvest. We're going to be hungry. He said wisdom and knowledge will be the stability. A lot of people didn't want to hear about that. They wanted to hear about a lightning bolt. <laughs> And the strength of salvation, the fear of the Lord is his treasure. And I just say this, the best defense towards anything is to, to trust in God and to have a, a fear or a reverence for the living God, you know, to be in communion with him. So even when things don't go right, listen, I prayed for a lot of things that never happened. I thought they were good things. <laughs> I would have certainly liked them. But I don't pout and take my toys and, and go home because God didn't answer some of my prayers. He knows better than I do. Sometimes God removes the circumstances. And sometimes God takes us through the circumstances. I know this, there's some guys on TV that will always tell you that God's like a celestial Santa Claus or a genie in a bottle. Or just, just demand it or say it in a certain way or keep repeating it and he'll give it to you. That's not reality. Reality is sometimes we go through the circumstances. And that's when it really shows what type of believers we are. To trust his will even in those difficult circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> well, the cool thing at the end of the story was the people did not see how God allowed this to go so long. And they looked over the wall and they saw the Assyrians eating their food and stealing their livestock. And, and trampling their, their fields. And they, they thought, you know, harvesting season is, is almost over. Even if God does remove them, and he did, we're going to starve to death. You know what's really cool? God made miraculous things happen. The seed that was left grew really fast. It was almost like in the wilderness. You know, we have to really, we have to believe in miracles. Because we see miracles in the Old Testament. We see miracles in the New Testament. We have to believe. We have to trust God. You know, even when we don't understand situations, that's the hardest time to trust him. But we still have to trust him. That's like, you know, when you get married, I'm, I'm doing a, a wedding uh, next week, right? For better or for worse. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Because sometimes marriage is a for worse. Amen? Listen, I'm, I'm the pastor, but I'm still a sinner. And sometimes I get on my wife's nerves and she promised to stay with me even when I'm a jerk. You know what I'm saying? So, um, now God is the perfect spouse, but sometimes he tells us things we don't like to hear. Folks, this is Bible literacy. It makes us stronger people. It, makes, it, it grows our faith. It's good stuff. It really is. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. God loves it when we, we reverence him, we respect him, we trust him. Um, it's just the way it is. Verses 7 through 9, there were some, and again, you see these, and it's, it's, I tell you what, when you study the prophetic books, you really have to pay attention because in the middle of a verse, God could be speaking to a different audience, and we see some of that here. In verses 7 through 9, so you had the, God speaking to the, the culture of the wicked Assyrians who were just ruining everybody's lives. Your time is coming. He shifted to the culture of the remnant who were interceding for everybody in Jerusalem. And then he shifts to the culture of Jerusalem. Pretty cool, huh? See all these different cultures. And they're, they're befuddled. They're incredulous. They're upset. Because they had this plan that didn't include God, and it didn't work. And as they looked around, they were the leaders, and they looked around at the, the devastation and the barrenness. Because they were not people of great faith, they couldn't see the miracle that God was going to do afterwards. All they could see was the chariots broken up. They could see the fields busted up. They could see the sorrow and, and, and the sadness while the godly, godly remnant was still being strong and praying. And they were crying. The valiant men, the soldiers, the leaders, they didn't listen to God. The ambassadors to Egypt, oh, Egypt's going to help us. Ah, I know we have to believe, but we need to take matters in our own hands. God's like, no, Egypt's not going to help you. And they didn't. And Jerusalem... And Judah was, was in ruins. But God 
made in the scripture in the Bible, he says God will give us beauty for ashes. Literally out of the ashes, God made beautiful things regenerate. So folks, we, we could have some things in our lives. They could be broken relationships. They could be estrangement from loved ones. God can still take those ashes and make beauty. I just really want to encourage you with that. And on any given Sunday, I don't even know who I'm talking to. I'm just going as the Spirit. You know, I'm speaking to a group, and people come to me and take me aside and goes, you know what you said? I don't even know what I said. God just kind of led me through this, but it, it reaches people because it's the truth, because it's God's Word. What other book was written almost three millennia ago that can speak personally to our lives? Only the living Word. That's why it's called the living Word. It's beautiful. So contrasting cultures at the end of the day, um, there were three groups, three groups. Again, I look at Assyria. To me, that represents the culture of the world. You know, we have the culture of Iran. We have the culture of North Korea. We also have the culture of materialism in the United States, self-centeredness, you know, things like that. I love my country, defended the Constitution for 25 years, but there's a lot of things that God isn't pleased with in American culture. And sometimes we look at the American dream and put it above what God's will is, and that's not right. We have to prioritize. So we look at the first culture, the culture of the world. Jerusalem represented the second culture, the culture of those that was a big tent, but it included true believers and false believers, right? And we can look at Christendom today. So what is Christianity? Claims one billion followers? Are all those people weak? No, not for me to judge, but Jesus said it right in the Word. A lot of them are false believers. A lot of them are tares that Satan sends into the church to cause havoc. And believe me, over 15 years, I've seen churches split and divide over just nasty, petty things. That's not true Christianity. It's not. It's, it's a group of people that don't have God's interest at heart. Instead of bringing together, they divide. And I hear some of these people with titles constantly dividing, dividing, dividing instead of bringing us together, healing. So you got the second culture, the Jerusalem culture, the Christian culture. Ooh, should I say sometimes the Calvary culture, Calvary Chapel. This is why I don't ask to be on the radio. You actually have to ask because I want the freedom to say these things. You know what I'm saying? Um, some, th some things in Calvary, things start out good. And then you get sometimes haughtiness and arrogance in certain quadrants of, of a certain denomination. So, listen, great Baptist people out there, great Presbyterians, great, great Calvary people, we don't corner the market on greatness. You know, we're just part of the body of Christ. So, the third is the praying godly remnant. The third is the most important. The third is the culture of true believers. Why do we come to church? Well, it's a nice church. <laughs> Makes me feel good on a Sunday. I feel clean after being in a job all week. That's not, that's not the answer. And put the X, it's wrong. The answer is because I love Christ. I love people that are like-minded. And, and if you look at the church in the book of Acts, when the church started, that's what the church was supposed to look like. Brothers and sisters, diverse in their backgrounds and language and ethnicity, all coming together under one tent, understanding the same of God's Word. When I meet somebody that comes off the missions field, or I meet somebody from another country, and maybe they even have a heavy accent, and we just start to talk, it's like I've always known them. They start sharing the Word with me, we encourage each other, we pray together, and it's like, I feel like I've known this person my whole life. I just met them, and they live a half a world away. And I'll miss them when they leave. So the, 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 true, the, the true believers, the Christian culture that's redeemed by the blood of Jesus, praying and interceding for others, does it mean we're perfect? No. The, the, the remnant in Jerusalem, when they went home, did they do some sinful things? I'm sure they did. You know, we're redeemed, but we're not perfect. But our desire is to please God and, and to put His will above our will. So as we look at these contrasting cultures 27, 2800 years ago, we also see those contrasting cultures today, brothers and sisters. And in this world of contrasting cultures, the question is, which one do we fit in with? 
Which one are we in? Which one would we like to be in after this message? Because truthfully, there's only one that's going to be brought into eternity with Christ and live forever and ever. And again, it's a choice that the Lord gives us. Let's pray.